So, um, I've got the pleasure of briefly introducing Ian, who we've been working with for uh, a little while now. Uh, Ian's one of the scariest fellows I know. Um, <laughs> having spent a long time in oil and gas, um, being a, a, an engineer uh, originally, uh, he has now, over the last uh, decade or so, become a very committed climate activist, I would say, um, but always working from a strong evidence base, looking very closely at uh, peak oil, which is something, as an oil guy, he's probably well placed to, uh, to look at, and, uh, and realising that one of the biggest challenges we have is being able to communicate why uh, climate change might be a problem, and to be clear what we might need to do about it, both as leaders and as members of the companies and communities we occupy. So um, I commend Ian's uh, chat with you today. Um, I've got some copies of that Megacities report, uh, just a few uh, that if you're interested you can grab on your way out. And I promise you that um, whilst uh, Ian won't be using the, the vehicle of a polar bear, uh, as we can see out the front there, which was a fantastic way to communicate the issue, he'll be no less scary and inspiring. <laughs> Over to you, Ian. Well, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Steve, for the introduction, and, and Lou, uh, much appreciated. I'm not sure about the scary bit, but anyway. Um, what we've seen, I, or heard, I think, in the, the, even the first part of this uh, festival this morning, is an incredible range of innovation being talked about, um, which is actually really heartening, because we're going to need all of that and more, in my view, to face up to the sort of changes we actually have to make. Um, what I'd like to do uh, very briefly to this, this afternoon is really just to set a bit of a scene as to why we are going to have to move very, very quickly on some of these mega changes in a way that I would argue the world has never really had to do before. Um, some of you might, may find this a little bit disconcerting, at least the first bit, but hang in there because it's basically a positive message because what we can't do is continue what we're doing today. So, um, here we go. Okay. So, we really have to get beyond the carbon tax. And I put the tax in inverted commas because it's not a tax. I mean, what it is is basically the removal of an enormous subsidy we've been enduring um, really since the Industrial Revolution. And it's not, it's also a redistribution. It's not taking things away from people, it's trying to change people's attitude and behavior. Uh, to a different form which is sustainable, essentially. You need, I think, to really understand it to look at the bigger picture and Dick Smith was quite right to be concerned last week. I mean, population is the big issue and we are at a quite unique point in world history in the sense that we've never seen population, population accelerate so rapidly. Um, we're about 7 billion today. In 45, um, slightly after I was born, it was just 2 billion. It's tripled or slightly more by today. I think in those days you could term it an empty world. I think today you'd have to say we've got a full world in terms of the impact on the environment to the point where the geologists and the scientists are now redefining our era as the Anthropocene um, because we're now having such a major impact on what's going on. And the question is where are we going? Well, the UN, I think about two weeks ago, came out with their latest forecast, which suggests that by 2100, we'll be up to 10 billion. Um, but whether that will happen, I think, remains to be seen. So population's a key issue, and um, the effect of that and the consumption, uh, everybody seeking higher standards of living, increased consumption, uh, understandably, is that we now need about one and a half planets to live on in terms of ecological footprint uh, today. Now that's on average. If everybody lived at the US levels, it would be about four planets. At Australian levels, it would be about three, and European levels perhaps slightly less. Now you can't keep doing that. It's not going to happen. Something really, I think, has to give. Now this conference really is all about everything connecting, and indeed it does. At the moment, the implications of that ecological debt I think are now starting to come through in a, in a very hard-nosed sense. Um, the immediate issues are the peaking of oil supply, climate change, um, food and water shortages that we see around the world and in this country, 
food prices increasing, and financial instability uh, with the GFC and the events that are now unfolding. Now, we tend to look at those in silos, but in effect, they're all inextricably linked. And the problem we have is we're just not joining the dots. And what they represent is really the fact that what we are currently operating under is just not a sustainable world. The uh, financial crisis, I would argue, was actually triggered, not totally caused, but triggered by the peaking of oil supply in U.S. cities <coughs> and the suburbs around U.S. cities where people on very high, <coughs> very high debt levels and so on could no longer suddenly afford to continue uh, with their lifestyle because the cost of their gasoline became too high. And so the dominoes started to fall in a small way initially, but then it reverberated around the world. Now, that's not the only reason. Uh, there's a whole lot of ethical problems in terms of the way the financial markets were operating, but uh, it's certainly a trigger point. So let's just talk about uh, a couple of key things. I'll touch on energy and climate. I won't cover food and water in the time. But firstly, looking at energy. Um, cheap energy is the thing that really has engendered our prosperity really way back since the Industrial Revolution. And if you look at the diagram, you can see that um, this is, these are, for each country, their um, energy demand figures of um, primary energy per capita versus GDP from 1980 to 2004. So you can see this is 80 up to 2004 from Australia. And you can see we've gradually been increasing our energy intensity as our GDP per capita has gone up. Up at the top here, you've got Canada and the US, North America, where the, the um, if you like, the intensity of energy demand is sort of stabilized. Then you've got the European countries in the middle here. Australia has been slightly above that. And then down here, you've got the BRICs, the Chinas, the Indias, the Brazils, and so on. And the real problem we have is that the demand of the rapidly developing countries is now moving up toward European type demand and maybe on. And the question you then have is, well, where is this uh, supply going to come from if it keeps moving in the way that we uh, have seen it happen ourselves? And the problem we have is that even if China moved from their current position of a relatively low primary energy consumption to GDP up into the European levels, you're going to need roughly two more Saudi Arabias purely to meet Chinese oil demand. Saudi Arabia is the largest oil producer in the world, about 10 million barrels a day, and we're going to have a problem because peak oil is now upon us. Um, you've probably heard the word. It's not terribly well understood, but the concept is, is fairly simple. What it really says is that when you start drilling an oil field, you drill a lot of wells, you delineate the reservoir, the production rises, you get to the point where you've completed the drilling, it's saturated, you hit a peak, and then because the pressure in the reservoir gradually then declines as you take oil out, you go up one side of a bell curve, you reach a peak, and then you decline down the other. Now, it, it's a little more complicated than that mathematically, but that's broadly the concept. The issue is that when you, um, you get to the peak here, it's not that you've run out of oil, You've used roughly half the oil, it's the area under the curve here, half the oil you'll ever produce. Um, the other half is yet to come. The problem is that you can't really increase the production because it's limited by the reservoir characteristics, not by price, not by economics, purely by technology. Now, that's the sort of picture for an individual oil field. If you add it together for an oil province, and you get a similar pattern, um, you may find that it, the shape varies slightly depending on the, the sort of reservoir you're talking about and geopolitical events interfere like people shutting things in or refusing to supply. But broadly that's the picture and this is actually Norway uh, where Norway has now um, since the 70s seen an enormous growth. This is what they developed their sovereign wealth fund on and now they're over the peak and they're coming down the other side. Now when you add that up in a global context um, then the question's always been, well, will we reach a global peak? And th those of us in the peak oil community have argued that would be the case for quite some time. And this is simply the problem. The blue bars here are basically oil discoveries. The black line is production. And the lighter blue out here are future discoveries as forecast. Now, it's a bit like a bathtub. 
if you have a tap coming in at the top, you've got a plug hole at the bottom and water's going out and the tap is pouring it in. As long as the amount coming in is less than the amount going, is more than the amount going out, then the bath stays full or overflows. Once you reverse it, then gradually the reservoir, the water in the bath sinks. And that's what's happening. Um, we've been buffered by all these discoveries for the last uh, two or three decades. Uh, we're not finding anywhere near as rapid a rate. That is why we're in the Gulf of Mexico and things like Deepwater Horizon happened. And um, we don't think, as things now turn out, that that's going to particularly change. So the question is, what do you uh, really do about that? Well, the International Energy Agency, this is not just Ian Dunlop uh, taking an extreme view, um, are now very concerned. This is their annual uh, en World Energy Outlook from last year, last November. And what they're showing is that conventional crude oil is now dropping off here. Um, we have the overlay of natural gas and unconventional oil, but we're going to have to find this much between now and 2035, which is about four Saudi Arabias. And that's pretty unlikely given the rate of uh, discovery that we've been seeing around the world in recent time. So we have a gap, and it may well be that within the next <coughs> 20 years we find oil is dropping off, availability has dropped off by 20 or 30 percent compared with what we have been used to, <coughs> which is that oil always meets the demand. <coughs> now for a world that is completely committed to oil, that is a, a, an enormous change, and it's something we need to be preparing for. Um, unfortunately, governments in this country and many other countries have not really viewed it as being serious. The IEA finally is now starting to take it seriously. So that's one issue. Then let's look at global warming. Well, I want to show you now a picture. I'll take a little bit of time on this, but it's important. This is a history of planetary temperatures since the Eocene period 65 million years ago. It's been developed by NASA's top climate scientist, Jim Hansen, who's in the Goddard Space Center in New York. And what it shows is that here, way 65 million years ago, we had this very high peak, the Eocene peak in temperatures. And then temperature dropped off, and uh, the scale is slightly different here to bring out the effect. But that's broadly where global temperatures went to. And then we moved into this period half a million years ago where you get this sort of rapid change. And up here, the Holocene, the last 10,000 years, is us. That's where we've come from. <coughs> we, d we emerged during the Holocene. So we're really quite an insignificant bit of this long, long, long history. So the information used here is taken from deep ocean um, <coughs> temperature changes as a proxy for surface temperatures which is based on some of the most reliable paleoclimate information you can get. So what happened during this period? Well, 34 million years ago, our Antarctica glaciation started, and the ice sheets gradually started spreading as the temperature dropped down. Then about four and a half million years ago, the same glaciation started in the northern hemisphere in the Arctic and um, it started to form here, and as the temperature dropped, then uh, the glaciation essentially spread. Then through this last half million <coughs> years or so, or the last m million years, we've had these varying swings between ice ages and warm periods where our carbon dioxide content's been somewhere between 180 and 300 parts per million. You can see it down here. And you can see it varying with the actual variation in temperature in the top graph. Now, the last uh, 10,000 years in the Holocene has been a relatively stable period where temperature has only varied by about half a degree C around a mean, and sea levels have been relatively um, static. And that's when, essentially, we emerged. Now, the CO2 level today is not 300, but 391 parts per million. But the thermal inertia um, means that's the, the, the speed with which the ocean takes the heat and then translates into climate change, means that the temperatures we're seeing today will increase further, even with what we've done today, never mind anything we do from here on. Now, we've seen temperature increases of about uh, 0.8 
0.83 degrees C since 1900. And today's temperature is about 0.6 of a degree above the peak temperatures that occurred during the Holocene period here. This is important because it's, uh, it's critical to understand that we're now moving out of the time in which humanity has essentially emerged. The two degrees C temperature that you here talked about as being the limit of, uh, we must stay below for, uh, to avoid dangerous climate change um, is essentially something that is a political number. It, it doesn't have a lot of scientific justification, but it's what was accepted as being a reasonable level. Now, when the climate system reaches equilibrium, when the full effects of the feedbacks and ocean changes come through, then the sort of the two degree C temperature increase means that effectively we will be at this level here. Now, that level means that this is a higher temperature um, than it was before the North Hemisphere glaciation actually started. So what that means is that two degrees C is sufficient for a large part of Greenland and Western Antarctic ice sheets to be lost, which means that we see a sea level increase of probably around six to seven meters. And that is a very, very large increase for large parts of the, <coughs> the current uh, global community, which are very close to sea level. So two degrees C in Jim Hansen's view, and it's one I've had for a long time too, is too much. It is actually a prescription for disaster if we don't stop it. But there's more. The best emission levels um, at present, if you take all the commitments made by governments, and that includes Australia at 25%, not 5%, which is what we're currently aiming for. We said we might go to 25 will still will lead to something like a four degree temperature increase by 2100. Now, a four degree temperature increase, whoops, sorry, um, brings us up here. And that means that effectively what we're going to see over time, not instantaneously, but over time, is a complete loss of all ice sheets on the planet. And that's something like 70 meter sea level rise. So, you know, this is a very different world. And if you want to think about what a four degree temperature rise means, then there's a very interesting publication that has summarized it, which you need a large glass of red to read, actually. But it's, uh, <coughs> it's, it's, it needs to be looked at because you need to understand what it is we're dealing with in trying to handle this problem. That's right. Um, so, the problem we've got is that what we're currently doing has almost guaranteed that Greenland and Arctic and, and the Western Antarctic ice sheet will go. What the commitments politicians have made so far, if we do nothing better than that, is going to mean that the rest of the ice sheets go too, uh, which will radically transform the, the civilization <coughs> basically as we know it. Now this is the stuff that is not talked about in the current debate. We're not talking about what problem we're trying to solve. The carbon debate in Canberra is not about climate change. It's about who's going to win the next election. And we've got to change this. And corporate leaders also need to understand this because we need leadership, real leadership, that is going to sensibly address this and not stuff around the edges pretending it might all go away. Now, if you want confirmation of what's going on, uh, this is a picture of what's happening to uh, Arctic sea ice volume today. Um, this has basically just come out so a couple of weeks ago. This is month by month, so here's from January right the way through to uh, September, I think it is here. You can see it down there. And this is the way in which sea ice has changed the, uh, our volume since 1979. And you can see the speed with which it's dropping. And these other curves here are just quadratic fits to those uh, actual curves, which show that the September sea ice will be gone by probably 2015, and maybe the total ice by 2030 or thereabouts. So it's happening. I mean, this is the empirical evidence. I mean, Alan Jones can say what he likes on 2GB, but the fact is you can't avoid the empirical evidence. Now, I, I, can, I don't have time to show you today, but. You can look at similar things in, uh, on, on rainforest destruction in the Amazon, in uh, Southeast Asia. All around the world, 
these indicators are there, the key performance indicators of climate change. So this is the reality, unfortunately, whatever we might like to think politically or in corporate terms or in uh, shock jock terms. And there are a whole range of other uh, potential tipping points around the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ones I've talked about. The biggest issue in all of this perhaps is the permafrost in the Arctic, which contains about twice as much uh, carbon as the atmosphere does. And once that starts melting, you start to get CO2 and methane uh, emissions coming through from that. And there is evidence that, that is actually already occurring. So um, I won't go through all the rest of these. There's a much <laughs> longer presentation that has a lot of detail if anybody's interested, actually. So these things, uh, the tipping point concept is the idea that we don't just have a linear change. The climate, in fact, will change and at a certain point it might suddenly flip into a new equilibri equilibrium state which is much less conducive to human development than um, we've been accustomed to through the Holocene. I mean, a four degree temperature increase, um, the carrying capacity of the planet under four degrees C is probably around a billion people, not seven, not ten. And that's the reality. I mean, that's some of the best scientific advice you can get. There's a conference in Melbourne in July, actually, on four degrees C and what it means. There was one in Oxford about three, two years ago, three years ago. Um, so this is what we're grappling with. So we need to, to face reality. These are the sorts of things that are happening. I won't go through them in, in um, detail. I can explain them um, separately if anybody's interested to pursue it. And we need to change the whole framework under which we're trying to address this problem. Uh, we, of course, are leaders. I mean, this is Australia in carbon dioxide equivalent per person. We're way up the top of the pile here, about 28 tonnes per capita. Uh, and we're pretending that why should we change <coughs> when the rest of the world is not doing anything? The rest of the world is moving much, much more rapidly than we are. The other issue that is uh, not often commented on is the, in the linkage, again everything connects, between climate and energy. If you take all of the fossil fuels in the, in the world, uh, the proven reserves, gas, oil, coal, they total, the blue bar here, about uh, 2,800 gigatons of CO2. The climate modelling that's been done, if we want to stay purely below the 2 degrees C level of temperature, we cannot afford to burn more than 30 to 40 percent of the remaining proven fossil fuel reserves in the world. Uh, otherwise we exceed that limit. And 2 degrees C is already too high. So you have to ask the obvious question, well why do we continue to explore for this stuff? I mean why are we in the Gulf of Mexico? Why isn't that money going into low carbon alternatives? So where do we go from here? Well. Rather than a problem, this is actually the great opportunity because we can't keep doing what we're currently doing. It's just not um, tenable to keep going in this way. The first thing we've got to do is be honest about what we're trying to achieve. Um, it's a far bigger problem than we're being told, but unless you're honest, you're honest about it, we're never going to find the right solutions to it and we don't have very much time. So we have to see not 5% emission reductions by 2020, but 50%, 10 times more. We have to see almost complete decarbonisation by 2050. We need not only to stop emissions and reduce them, we've actually got to start drawing down carbon from the atmosphere because we're 391 at the moment. We've got to get back to probably somewhere below 350, toward 300 preferably. And we really have to see those emissions peak within five years. This is not something that we know we'll think about it and we might make some changes by 2050 which is the way most of our current uh, political debate goes. Um, we've got to get on with it. And we've got to take peak oil seriously and prepare. I mean, you don't, the trouble with peak oil, you're not quite sure when it's going to happen because what's been occurring is the oil price goes up. Once it hits $100 a barrel, there's a recession in the US. So demand drops. And then you drop, things pick up again, the price comes up, and so you go along in this undulating plateau, which may, may go on for quite some time. But the point is, the peak is probably here already, and we need to prepare. We should have been doing it a decade ago. We've done nothing, and we are actually extremely exposed because our self-sufficiency is now 
50 percent is probably going to be less than 20 percent <coughs> by 2020, 2025. So there's some very big issues which we're not thinking about and honesty is the first step. So the solutions, well from a global warming point of view we've got to see early introduction of carbon pricing. Um, you know you don't allow sewage to slosh around the streets, you expect people to clean up after their operations and they incorporate it in the cost of their ventures and so on. It's the same with carbon, we can't any longer just allow people to pollute. Now people who've been producing carbon have known for the last decade that this was coming. Um, so there's little excuse for compensation. We have to recycle to the less well off, to the community, because this is about redirecting behaviour. It's not about taking money away from people, it's getting us to change our habits. Um, so recycling is critical, it needs to go to the community and to low carbon innovation to make these things happen quickly. We've got to have complementary measures, you can't just do it with carbon pricing alone. Um, I believe what we'll get to is personal carbon trading before long which is now being trialled on Norfolk Island and has been or developed in the UK for quite some time now because it has to happen not just with the big polluters but right the way through the community. We all have got to change our habits and we're not very good at doing it. We have to get rid of fossil fuel subsidies, um, there's got to be major support for biosequestration. Uh, the soil carbon issues you've heard about, reforestation. The carbon capture and storage idea, that's geological storage of carbon where you extract it from the smokestacks of uh, power stations or whatever or before you burn it, you put it underground and store it long term. It's been done in the oil industry for decades, I was doing it in the North Sea in the 1970s but it's, not, it's one thing to do it in the oil industry where you have defined reservoirs with safe storage that you're reasonably confident about. It's com something completely different to do it in water aquifers and salt domes which have never been really tested for that purpose. And what we're talking about here is to make that work you have to create something that's the size of the world oil industry. And I just don't think it's going to happen in that way. So yes we may need it to some extent but don't assume it's a silver bullet. We have got to retain our options and it depends on what you think the size of the problem is. If you believe it's as urgent and large as I do then we've got to stop high carbon projects now. So we don't have either any more export or domestic projects unless we can sequester the carbon safely and there's no sign of that actually happening in the short term. So we just have to face up to that fact and look at much more innovative ways of trying to manage this process. I'm not saying it's not a use for coal but it's not going to be the traditional use uh, that we've been accustomed to. We need stringent vehicle and uh, aircraft emission standards um, because transport is one of the key problems of course in an emissions context. If you look at energy, well efficiency and conservation there's an enormous potential because we're extremely wasteful in the way we use energy. But it's not just efficiency, you've also got to conserve it, so you've got to use less. We need the full range of renewables and who knows what's going to come to the top of the pile. And if you come to Gunter Pauli's talk tomorrow you'll hear a whole lot of ideas about things we've never even thought about that um, might well suddenly come out of the woodwork to surprise us. So I recommend uh, you listening to that. We have to give serious consideration I think to new generation nuclear, not the old technologies because of the size of the problem but it's not going to be a help in the short term because a lot of those things <coughs> are still embryonic. We have to carefully look at biofuels, avoiding conflict with food and making sure that we do genuinely have an emissions reduction potential. The US launched into ethanol in a big way and it's been a complete disaster because it's probably environmentally worse. Um, than it would have been if they'd stuck to fossil fuels. But there are interesting technologies coming through, uh, second generation biofuels particularly. Gas to liquids and coal to liquids which our Minister for Resources is extremely keen on, maybe, I don't personally think it's going to happen but gas might, I don't think coal will. <coughs> gas is the flavour of the month um, but be careful, coal seam gas may be worse than coal. Uh, when you add up the full potential emissions uh, pot um, impact and the same with um, shale gas. 
Fuel cells, of course, are one area. And there's a whole lot of other things in there in terms of distributed energy that I don't have time to really get into, which are going to transform the way in which we live. I mean, if you can start to have small-scale energy distributed in rural areas, it changes the whole concept of the way we live and the way manufacturing might work and industries move, decentralization and so on. Um, finally, we need preparation for peak oil with an oil allocation system as we had in the 70s on a smaller scale. Uh, to handle the, the allocation of a scarce commodity when peak oil really starts to bite. If you look at infrastructure, um, major urban redesign um, I think is critical. High density sustainability, integrated public transport, decentralization of work. Rail will become a major transport mode for both passengers and freight. We need electricity as the, probably the dominant energy supply, but from clean, clean, uh, clean sources. We really have to stop freeway and airport construction because all that's doing is creating more car use in a conventional sense and find other ways to, to provide mobility. Air travel is none clear as to where we're going to go. If we can make some of these really innovative bio, um, biofuels work, maybe it will continue, but I suspect that not in the way we've been accustomed to. Localized food production will come back into fashion. Um, IT is going to be an enormous innovative area, I think, in terms of handling reduction of ecological footprint around the world. And um, Alex Zelinsky gave a very interesting talk uh, earlier this afternoon, actually, on that, uh, what the CSR are doing on that. <coughs> and then enhanced resource productivity across the board. Waste has to become a major resource and the things we do become zero waste, full stop. And a lot of that is actually happening, but it's not happening probably quick enough at this stage. In terms of risk and resilience, um, we have a bit of a problem because, I mean, what we have seen in, you know, I think, through the period of globalization in the last 20 years is a decreasing resilience within the global community. We all now are so interconnected. The moment something happens in the Midwest and US, it reverberates through the economy and the whole pack of cards collapses. Um, we, one of the benefits of the uh, market economy is that it's allowed you to grow as organizations. At some point, organizations typically fail, but they are, have a system, we have a system that they break down, regroup, rebirth, and grow again. That's been very valuable at one sense. But as things have become bigger and bigger, we've got to the stage where everything is now too big to fail. So we're getting to the point where we're now overextending something that is completely unsustainable. And when that collapses, it becomes catastrophic. Uh, and uh, I think that's one of the biggest problems we've got in the way in which we're looking at these issues. And if you look at the way in which, for example, the resource industry reacts to climate change, that's exactly the problem. You know, we're all locked in to this conventional wisdom that says the boom is going to go on ad infinitum uh, in the way that we've seen it. Well, I think the boom will go on, but it's not going to be in the way that you thought. So we really have to rethink. And one of the problems is that little thing that Sinclair, Upton, Upton Sinclair wrote about in the 1930s. It's difficult to get a man to understand something if his salary depends on him not understanding it. And that's exactly our problem with incentives in the corporate world. We are now locked into an incentive system that is totally short term, that does not take account of any of these issues, and until we change incentives, this won't alter. Uh, so corporate leaders in the room, that is your first priority tomorrow morning, dismantle the incentive system. Uh, institutional issues, well, I think we are at the point where conventional growth will not continue in the way we've known it. Um, we really have to move to a completely different concept of society, steady state growth and what have you, which there's a lot of work going on. We really have to redefine success um, based on long-term sustainability as a hard-nosed commercial issue, not on uh, maximizing consumption. Markets are important, but they really have to focus on, on enhancing the commons, not on short-term profit maximization. Um, we're going to need new forms of community involvement and democratic structure because the existing system can't handle the sort of changes that we're talking about now. Ross Garner is quite right. Climate change in some way has got to be put outside the political system. Otherwise, we won't solve this. I think it's going to lead to 
great opportunities for new cooperation between the North and the South that developed in the developing world. Um, major changes to the way we see business models, particularly the incentive issue. And the, the, the re-emergence of that thing called statesmanship, which we used to have back in the 50s and the 60s, but I think we'd see virtually none of these days, where we have leaders who are prepared to look at the long term, irrespective of short-term consequences, and take action accordingly. And finally, perhaps the most important issue, we need community awareness and commitment to recognize the problem and really push for change. Because unless the community is pushing, then our nominal leaders in our current system will never do anything. And I think that's no better demonstrated than what we've seen in the last uh, 12 months in this country. But what this is all doing is triggering the greatest innovation wave we've ever seen. I mean, these are the this is what people call the sixth wave, but sustainability, resource productivity, biomimicry, the stuff that Gunter will talk about tomorrow. I mean, this is all um, incredibly exciting stuff. But the issue is that it's now got to start happening in a way that is much accelerated, I think, from the way that it might move under conventional reform processes. But it's not just technology. Um, we have to see a value change. I mean, the, the 20th century, I think, was really focused on the economy, on quantity, consumption, growth, materialism, and so on. I would argue that the 21st century is going to be completely different, where the environment dominates, not in a fuzzy, warm, fuzzy sense, but as a hard-nosed business imperative. We don't have a sustainable environment. You don't have an economy. And I think the climate change issues just point that up. It's an economy where we're using less, we're doing more with less. Um, Self-restraint, much more cooperation, globalism. We think long term, not short term. You may think this is all very idealistic. But the problem is quite simply that if we don't start to move in this direction, um, we're going to have much bigger problems. So it is our, our great opportunity, but it requires a radically different approach. Um, the existing system, in my view, is not capable of handling uh, these problems either in time or in substance. We have a very short window. We have an enormous change to make. So we've got to have a circuit breaker which is really going to bring about rapid transformation. Um, it really means that we've got to move the system beyond its comfort zone very, very quickly. And I think the only way we can do this is to use the emergency war footing uh, concept in the way that was done in Europe post-World War II, the way in economies of changes pre-World War II, the Apollo project, <coughs> the snowy scheme, um, but much, much bigger in a nation-building sense. Um, we can do that if we have the right incentive, and now we've got it, I would argue. I mean, people think this is extreme, but the, f the, the simple fact of life is that if you believe, accept what the climate science is saying, you cannot do this uh, with the existing processes. So um, you've got to really start to move to something of this kind. It needs the whole community and the business sector in particular to get in behind it. Um, but if you are prepared to trigger that, then I think we have a way of solving this. We know what the solutions are. We know the technologies. There are all sorts of other stuff that is probably coming through that may do it much better than we think at the moment. And I've shown just the conventional stuff on there, but. Um, listening to the other speakers around the room, you know, you have to get really excited by the fact that incredible things are actually going on. So two questions I'd leave with you. Um, as Russ Garno said, our advantage, is, our advantage is a low cost supplier of energy and raw materials likely to be even greater after a successful transition to a low carbon economy than they are in a world with fossil fuels. So the question really is, uh, will we seize the opportunity or are we going to still stick there, stick in the <coughs> head in the sand and avoid the issues? And the other, which I always like, is in times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the rest find themselves beautifully equipped for a world which no longer exists. So the question really is, will we learn in time? I would uh, urge you, as leaders in your own particular groups within the business community and so on, to really try and get abreast of these issues and really put the pressure on your system, your corporation, whatever it is, to start to change the terms of the debate. Because unless it comes from your level, the community, 
corporate leaders and what have you, then we're not going to solve this. But um, once we get that ball rolling, which I think is starting to happen, then we can. So thank you very much. Thanks, Steve.